uh, this talk is a reschedule from uh, March <laughs> when everything turned upside down for everyone. And, but nevertheless, I'm still very happy to see all of you uh, in your little square <laughs> and healthy and happily there. So uh, we will talk about the recent work on the Bionix quasi-local mass conjectures. And this is a joint work uh, with Dan Lee and we post the paper on archive during the summer. So, so GR is really, oops. <laughs> that's the worst thing, everything use the iPad now. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm sure I will get a call again because this, this time it happened to be my daughter's piano lesson. So, but we'll see. Okay, so, um, so the general activity is about the, trying to understand the property of the space time. <sighs> Sorry, <laughs> never expect it. Just give me one more, one minute. Sure. Technical problems. I apologize. Okay. okay. So uh, we will talk about space time, and the space time will satisfy the uh, Einstein equation. So the Einstein equation is the equation on the Einstein tensor, which says, which is defined to be the Ricci minus half of the scalar curvature times g. Here, g is a Lorentzian matrix. So um, we'll talk about the vacuum case. The vacuum case is when the Einstein tensor is zero. And we'll also touch upon, actually the main thing we will talk about is the no perfect fluid and no dust uh, space time, which just says mathematically, the Einstein tensor has a, a special form, right? So like a no perfect fluid, just say the Einstein tensor, which is some kind of Ricci tensor, and it has a special form only determined by a function P and the velocity V. We actually define no perfect fluid like a, we define your paper, but we found out there are other studies which come up this uh, space time quite intriguingly from the wave equation. Okay, and to study <laughs> Lorentzian space time, it's hard because it has a knot comb, it has a knot direction where the vector can be non-zero but has zero length. So a, a very successful approach is to look at just a slice of the space time. So which we call the initial data set. So from uh, geometers, we know if you look at hypersurface, you want to understand induced matrix and induced second fundamental form. And that's denoted by G and K. And also we have the Einstein tensor of the ambient space. We want to restrict the Einstein tensor on this size, which we call the Einstein constraint map. It turns out uh, this quantity phi, which will be very important to this talk called Einstein constraint map, last some restriction of the Einstein tensor. So G is the Einstein tensor. So you can um, in, insert two vectors, but we'll fix one to be the normal vector, which is the normal vector of the hypersurface. And that's called the Einstein constraint map. But interestingly, this map can also be written purely in terms of initial data sets, just G and K. And so let's by the Gauss and Kodat equation, so we can write the constraint map. Think about uh, instead of as a map when you input the Lorentzian matrix, but instead it's a, a map when you input the uh, initial data set. And it will output to be, um, we look at the components, GNN and GN, um, this one form. And so it's a, 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 you can say vector value or a form value map. And that's from the gauss kodat equation. So it looks quite complicated. You have the scalar curvature RG and the sound combination of the second fundamental form K. And in the Riemannian case, which we'll call Riemannian case is when K identically zero. So geometrically just say the slice is totally geodesic slice. And that reduced to this map reduced to the scalar curvature map. So many study of the Einstein constraint map are really motivated by the study of scalar curvature. There's, there's a very um, um, 
very interesting relation uh, between the Einstein constraint map and the scalar curvature map. Okay. And we're also looking at the dominant energy condition. So the dominant energy condition, uh, the special case is when uh, we call vacuum. The vacuum is when the Einstein tensor is identically zero. So that can be write down as the um, initial data set to have zero mu and zero J. But more generally, we're looking at uh, initial data set satisfy the dominant energy condition. So the dominant energy condition is some positivity condition of the Einstein tensor. And geometrically, just say the Einstein tensor is positive when you fix one input to be a normal vector, just like in the picture show. But then you say for any vector inside the light cone, which you call causal vector, and this quantity G and V has to be greater or equal to zero. But also just write down as an equation and scalar equation, let's say it's mu uh, is greater or equal to J. And we studied the dominant energy condition and we find out it's convenient to denote the notation called dominant energy scalar, which we'll think about as sigma. So sigma is just the subtraction mu minus nor of J. So the dominant energy condition will imply uh, equivalently the uh, implied the dominant energy scalar is greater or equal to zero. So in many ways, we find out this sigma is the, probably the best generalization for the scalar curvature. Uh, in the Riemannian case, this is exactly half of the scalar curvature, but you also generalize scalar curvature in other ways that we will see later. Of course, you think this is quite natural to define that, but you may think about uh, for example, define the scalar quantity to be the mu square minus j square, right? Because the norm of j is only a Lipschitz function. In general, it's not that differentiable. But in any way, we find out this sigma is the right generalization. And so for the following talk, if you really get confused about what Einstein constraint map is, what dominant energy condition is, you can just think about sigma is the scalar curvature, okay? All right, so, and we will focus on initial data set, which is asymptotically flat. And so um, it means um, the manifold itself, except the compact region, which can have really strange topology, outside is really just the Euclidean space. And also we assume the G and K decay to the, the flat data at the suitable rate and also some condition on mu and j. So mu and j must be integrable, which you can think about, we just require the scalar curvature and some derivative of k to be integrable, okay? So in general, I usually, when I give the talk, talk um, I usually don't say this quite explicitly because there's a quite technical assumption, but just in this talk in particular, we are looking at the de decay rate of q. <laughs> so this decay rate of q is, is, is there's a strange number q greater than n minus two over two, right? So uh, in general, people want to have the decay rate to be q is n minus two. So that kind of corresponds to the decay of harmonic function, right? So uh, like a, if it's three dimensional, the, the, the first decay of harmonic function is one over r, right? So usually we want n minus two, but it turns out there are many, many theorems can generalize to this decay rate. For example, um, the posit positivity part of the positive mass theorem. Um, sorry, sorry, let me backward a little bit. So on the least decay assumption, we can define the AD and energy momentum, which are just numbers. So E, P1 to Pn are just numbers. Whenever you give me a G and K, you output lot n plus one numbers. And that's by computing some integral over the sphere and let the sphere go to infinity. Okay, but it turns out these numbers are some invariant, very important. And people want to understand how uh, those numbers behave. For example, they want some positivity. So there's a positive mass theorem, which it says, in fact, under some condition, then this number E is greater or equal to the norm of those PIs. So P is the linear momentum and E is the AD energy. So that's 
the heart of the positive math theorem. That's the positivity part. There's also equal equality part. We will talk about that later. So, for example, the positivity part of the positive math theorem holds under this general general decay assumption. Okay. So the main part of this talk is, so in a nutshell, <laughs> we want to understand, um, study initial data sets, but using to recover some space-time information. So this has been done uh, in several fundamental ways. Uh, one milestone is the Cauchy problems. Cauchy problems tell you amazing fact is Whenever you're giving a vacuum initial data set, so remember, give a G and K satisfy the vacuum equation, then you actually determine the unique vacuum space time. So that's from the way we equation approach. But there's also another milestone in this type of study is again the positivity mass, uh, positivity of the mass. So the the mass, the EMP I mentioned earlier, they are the space time invariant. So it, is supposed to measure the space time and the total total mass, total energy, total linear momentum of the space time. But it can actually be read off from an uh, initial data set. So it can be evaluated on the initial data set. So if you want to understand the properties of those invariants, you just prove it on initial data set. So this has been very successfully done in the like a positive mass theorem Riemannian Penrose inequality. So in this talk, I will describe a characterization on initial data set, which more or less along the positive mass theorem, uh, uh, well, based upon the ideas there. And it tells you if we have an initial data set, which arise from some mass minimizing problem and more specifically, does the Barnett quasi-local mass minimizing problem. And then we will see this initial data set actually sits in a certain space time and with certain property. So the space time is a no perfect fluid space time and it has a killing vector field. So I say it's more or less along the line of positive mass theorem because let me go back to the previous page. So uh, we have the strict positivity of the space time which somehow is a, a loose information, right? You have some number defined initial data set and you show it's positive. But surprisingly, the equality case, so the positive mass theorem tells you if the mass is zero, then actually this slice sits inside Minkowski space time. So you also recover the whole space time information. So our result is more like a, if something is the equality case, then we can recover the whole space time information. Okay, so unless the general I'll have the talk as Bureau mentioned earlier. So if you have any questions, just feel free to interrupt me. I'm don't I don't have to rush to finish every slide. So the outline of the talk is first I will describe um, what the main result is, and let's relate it to the Bonnick's vacuum stationary conjectures. I will talk about what's that, and then we were uh, looking at some examples, no dust examples, which in some sense are counter examples to log conjecture. And if time allows, then I will talk about really the, uh, the main part, but I don't have to rush there unless the, uh, some key ingredients in our uh, result, that's about the space time killing vector and the relation to the dominant energy scalar. So, Quasi-local mass, quasi-local mass is a, a number which you should define on a compact region with boundary. So it's called quasi-local mass because it's in contrast with the ADM mass. The ADM mass is a global quantity defined on the unbounded manifold, while the quasi-local mass is defined over the finite region. So this concept used to be really hard to describe, but now, I think with the lockdown, you all have your own quasi-local mat, uh, own quasi-local living style, right? From your computer to the kitchen. And probably you can also see 
where your boundary is. And there are many definitions of the quasi-local masses. And I think right now the common belief is um, probably there's no one best definitions, but there are various definitions useful in various situations. And I will focus on the quasi-local mass proposed by Robert Barnick. So here we have a compact region, right? And it's like a, uh, in PDE, you define capacity of a set. Instead of looking at the function on this compact set, you're looking at extension. So Barnick defined the Barnick mass of this compact region by looking at all possible admissible extension. And you will want to uh, extend in a way you can compute the ADM mass. And we know ADM mass behave very well. And then we just take infima of the ADM mass among all possible extension. So here, there's a lot of information hiding in the word admissible. So I will not go into detail, but roughly speaking, being admissible uh, means here we're talking about extension. So that's the exterior region. So first it has to be asymptotically flat with the dominant energy condition, just because we want to use it to define, um, to be able to compute the ADM mass. And then it has to have certain matching boundary condition, right? So you want to match in a certain way. And so um, Barnick actually proposed this very specific matching condition. You don't need the full uh, G and K to match but instead you want this boundary data, for example, the induced matrix of the boundary and induced mean curvature, and also some quantity of this K. You want these quantities to match. And then there's a, another condition, I think that's the most mysterious condition called no horizon condition, which will say in say Riemannian case, let's just say the extension has no minima surface, right, because um, from physical arguing, you see the total mass can be uh, hit behind a minima surface because minima surface is like a boundary of a black hole. So you can put a lot of mass behind it, but you will not be measured by an observer at infinity. So we want to rule out that uh, possibility. But it's still very mysterious because there are various no horizon conditions which may work in different settings. So I will not go into the detail a lot. And to emphasize um, here is we're looking at exterior region. So whenever you give me an omega, satisfy the dominant energy condition, we don't care about what property it has, but we will show the extension has to, um, the minimum extension has to be very special. So when Barnick proposed his definition, he actually also proposed several conjectures because they're very naive questions you want to just ask right away. Right? Here you are taking um, infima among these tensions. So the question is, what property of the minimizer do you expect? So let's call the vacuum stationary conjecture. So it says the minimizer, um, if we have an extension and that's the ADM mass of that extension is the minimizer among all possible extension. And this minimizer has to be very special. It has to be vacuum. And also it has to see that in the space time, which has a time-like killing vector field. And which has time-like killing vector field just mean you have a diffeomorphism to move a different slice in time. Also, uh, there's a strict positivity conjecture, just like the positive mass theory. You want this number to be not negative. Can I ask, and, is a conjecture about stationary extension or static? Um, in the Riemannian case, it's called static. So more general case is called uh, stationary. But I, there's a difference. So the, there's a right, difference. Right. So right. I'm wondering if the, the conjecture says that the extension should actually be static, not right. just stationary. So, static is a subclass of stationary. So um, in general, you will not be the case, right? Because being static, you want to restrict your extension to be, for example, non-native scalar curvature. It follows, and then, yeah. yeah. Right. But um, so, th um, for example, even in uh, Schwarzschild, mm -hmm. if you boost the slice, 
you don't expect extension to be static, right? If you, you can pick a region, which is like a, you tilt in the structural space time. Mm -hmm. And then you, uh, if the parallel in quality holds, you will expect the extension will be probably a slice of the structural space time, but it will definitely not be static because it will not be a totally geodesic slice. Okay. Okay. All right. But then you, but you expect the extension to be stationary then? Um, so if, let's, if you take a boosted um, slice and stretch yield? Right. So we will get to it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. And there's also strip positivity conjecture, uh, which also, um, if the bonding mass is zero, then the region has to be in the Minkowski space time. All right. That's what is that to, to be true. So we were looking at these two conjectures. Uh, but also there's a, uh, another conjecture, I think it's probably the most little known conjecture. So I will I'll say there are less results on this conjecture called the minimum mask extension conjecture. I didn't even write the statement, but roughly speaking is whether a minimizer exists, right? So the existence of a minimizer is always, I think a harder question. So, um, there are a lot of work, I just list some few names, but there are a lot of work working on these conjectures. And Bonnick himself also modified the conjectures, the statement along the time, because I think um, people just keep finding um, counter examples to some conjectures. And so the statements need to be refined. So I would say, understand the conjectures really not to prove this, but understand what conditions are needed in order to have the desired properties. So back to Spiro's question. So we have the Riemannian case. The Riemannian case of the Barnick mass is the most uh, intensively studied part. And we have several experts in the audience. I, I know Siri has worked along this direction. Probably Spiro's has done something um, along this direction. And in this case, uh, you want to looking at your region, the compact region, assumed to have non-native scale curvature. And then you also want to restrict the extension to have zero K. So the Riemannian extension. And equivalently, you can say we want the extension to have non-native scalar curvature. And in this case, the vacuum stationary conjecture is called the static conjecture. And it's proven um, by Covino. And also there's another approach by Barnick, Anderson, Jurgi. So this is true. This is confirmed in the Riemannian case. And I so, think also- so, Sorry, what are the assumptions here? Um, so the, if you have a Barnick mass minimizer. Okay, then it must, I see, I see, then I see. But what are the assumptions on the data? So if I data, take a, right, so if I take a surface, mm -hmm. what do I get to prescribe? The, the metric right, of the so, sphere, right? That, yeah. Yes, right. Yeah, so you have a, you won't have a minimizer. Sorry, mm -hmm. you yeah, won't have an extension which has non-native scale curvature and then it has matching induced matrix and the mean curvature. Right, 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 right. right. Yes, all right, and so, and then it actually proved, as Spiros pointed out, it's a stronger conclusion. They, they can show the matrix static, mm -hmm. which has several different ways, equivalent or different uh, way to describe it. For example, you can think about uh, from functional property, it just means it has a function f, positive and with this condition, satisfy this condition, it's the overdetermined equation, the Hessian equals to F times the Ricci of the matrix and the function F is harmonic. Or equivalently, that means you can looking at this what product matrix. It can be either Lorentzian or Riemannian and what product, the high, one dimensional higher matrix is Ricci flat. Or you can think about just mean uh, you have this initial data set is a totally geodesic inside this special special space time. And then this F actually comes from a Killing vector field. And that's quite easy to see because F is a function of G, so it does not depend on T. So it's a, a Killing vector. So the general case for the stationary conjecture very little was known until recently. So there is some partial progress by Covino and he says the bonic mass minimizer satisfies some properties. Uh, here we were looking at this 
operate a DeFi bar later, but for now you just think about uh, it's an overdetermined elliptic system. So it's a very restricted class of equations. So, so the data that you prescribe in this case, are they more general? So it's not just the metric and the, the mean curvature in the extension right. that you want, is it more? Yes, right. So you will also, let me go back to um, <laughs> the part I really didn't spend enough time. So the boundary data will be the trace of K right. along the tangential part, and then the K we treat on the normal. So in the static extension, it's just the first two. That's right. right? Exactly. It's the first two, but now you ask for more. Okay, fine. That's right. I understand. Yeah, so this condition is roughly speaking required, will imply the, if you only have first two conditions, right. that will imply the scalar curvature is distributionally positive. Mm -hmm. So you know the matching in general is not smooth, so you cannot compute the scalar curvature across the corner. But this condition ensures the distributionally scalar curvature is still positive. And if you add the later two condition, that's for the dominant energy condition. But is it clear that it's not an overdetermined? Is it clear that you're not asking for too much? It's a very good point. It turns out uh, so. Because for um, the static one, when it somehow I, I am under the impression it's well posed. Somehow it's, you, it's the right number of conditions for the static right. extension. So, but for the other, it's, <laughs> is it clear it's not overdetermined? Right. So it's a very difficult question, and actually mm -hmm. Barnick raised the question whether this. Mm -hmm boundary condition is elliptic. And yes. there is some work of Anderson Curry, they show is elliptic, but under some uh, gauge condition, right? Mm -hmm. Because, right, you need some condition. And they actually show is for the static extension. So if you just ask for general extension, it's not elliptic because you will have many extension. But mm -hmm. if you per ask particular static equation is a uh, elliptic problem. Okay. And so but, John but, Shan but, and, mm -hmm. it, it's one thing to be elliptic, but is it also, it is not overdetermined? Um, it's not, I don't it, think it's the same thing, right? I mean, really. um, the, the paper says not, it's just the right amount. I see, of just right. Okay, okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. And with the K, uh, this is a work by Zhong Shan An, a former student of Michael Anderson. She studied mm -hmm. uh, this, also showed it's a elliptic boundary condition. Okay. Okay. All right, so um, where are we? So that's the general case for the stationary conjecture. And uh, Zhong Shan, so she's a, a postdoc at UConn now. So you, she also showed the conjectures, the stationary conjectures holds, assuming the initial data set is vacuum. So remember, vacuum is the condition which should be the conclusion, but she said, okay, if it's vacuum, then she can prove there is a killing vector. So here is our result. Um, we're looking at this dimension in between three and seven. And although you will not see this dimensional restriction in my talk, that's related to, um, for example, the singularity of minima surfaces, which I will not discuss. So here we are in the safe zone region where the minima surface will not have singular singularities. Okay, so uh, suppose now we have a, a mass minimizer, then, here is a list of properties we can get. The first one is we show the dominant energy scalar is zero. So recall the dominant energy scalar is the difference of mu minus j, right? But the conjecture says it's expected to be vacuum, but we cannot show that. We cannot show mu is zero, j zero. Instead, we, show, we can only show the difference is zero. And then we show it does see the see, see inside a space time and has a killing has a killing vector field. But since the initial data set may not be vacuum, the space time may not be vacuum. So we cannot show it's vacuum space time. And also we cannot show the killing vector is time-like. Time-like has a, a very significant uh, physical reasoning, just as I say you can have the time. So the initial data set is invariant in time. So you just have, it's just changed by diffeomorphism. But we cannot show the killing vector is time-like, but nevertheless, there's a killing vector. Okay, can, I bother, you a little, can I bother you a little bit more? So if you take Please. a surface <laughs> in Kerr, so in Kerr, the, the stationary killing field is not time-like everywhere. So I'm wondering if you take a Kerr and you go a little bit outside the horizon, then I thought the, ex the extension exists. It is the Kerr metric. Right, mm -hmm. 
but the, the killing field, you also have the stationary killing field, cannot be time like because you know, in Kerr, it's not. It's a very good point. Right. So, um, we, I don't, I don't think I have the one answer to you, but we thought about this. It, probably you have to choose a suitable large region to avoid right. the, um, okay. Okay. Right. Right. the uh, where right. the, the killing horizon, right? Right. Right. right? In order to satisfy the no horizon condition. But okay. we, we, we don't know, we are not sure about it. Okay. Okay. And all right. So last three properties we uh, can prove for a bionic mass minimizer. And the last one is Suppose now we know the extension has positive ADM mass, then we can show its vacuum near special infinity. So somehow we are a step closer to the conjecture. And we have been thinking about that. If we can show such no dust space time with, uh, you see the third item say the killing vector, killing vector is already very special, but where it's not vacuum, it has to be um, no because it has to be parallel to the dust velocity. So it has to be null. It's an even more special property. So if you can rule out that, then we can show it's um, more or less most of the bonding conjecture. But in studying this property, we actually find out there are counter examples to this. So there are non-vacuum, no dust examples. Um, which satisfy consistent with our theorem, but we can show it's a bonding mass minimizer. So in other words, it will uh, contradict the vacuum stationary conjecture and the strict positivity conjecture, but only in dimension n greater than eight. <laughs> I have to say Bonnick proposed his conjecture only in three dimensions for no obvious reason, just physics, um, in general physics want to only looking at lower dimension. And, but we don't know in low dimension whether we can improve the result or, um, or there are other kind of examples is still unknown. Okay. All right, so um, I decided I will give you the examples. And so the no dust examples, it's actually not new examples, we just, probably found this in the bunch of literatures and by doing some more detailed computations. Um, so the no dust example, so remember the no dust is a Einstein tensor with a very special form determined purely by one vector. And in particular, um, also in our examples, we know V is a velocity and this space time need to have a killing vector field, which is null. How about let's just assume this V it's not only killing, but also it's just parallel. In particular, it implies killing. So, and we find out this actually a class called the PP wave space time. So it has a covariantly constant null vector, uh, which really just means this vector field describe gravitational wave. So we also know the gravitational wave is real. So this uh, model space <laughs> should be pretty real too. Um, and it just say nothing is changed. So the killing vector tell you, you have a uh, infinitesimal isometry along this direction. So the people will just tell you along a node direction, you can just, the wavefront is all diffeomorphism to itself, right? So equivalently, the space time is purely determined by the Einstein tensor is only determined by this vector. But away from physics, right down the matrix is quite simple. Here we have a space time matrix and I have n plus one variables. I have u, z, and x1 to xn minus one. And although it doesn't look like Lorentzian, but it's indeed a Lorentzian matrix. It has a zero direction, has a no direction. And here s is the only function, only unknown we are going to choose to satisfy certain property. And here is the constant two and this is all flat. And s is a function of only n variables x1 to xn minus one and z, but not the function, of, not the variable of u. So u will be a, a, a covariant constant vector. Here I 
also work out the Minkowski space-time. So I think all of you are familiar with the Minkowski space-time written in this way. And also probably some of you are familiar with this wave coordinate, right? Just write down dt, dx, and using this coordinate, diagonal coordinate, and you count out this one. But there's also another coordinate to write down Minkowski space-time in a, a bit unusual way. So this is more match what we have written here by letting s this function to be identically one. And this u slice is what we are going to take as the examples, but this u slice is a Riemannian slice, right? The induced matrix is just flat. So it's from, coming from the uh, boost of the usual flat, the constant time slice by boosting in certain way. Okay, so when s equals one, this is going to be a flat matrix. Two constant non-trivial examples will have s not equal to one. So we take the u slice to be an initial data set and just rewrite the reduced matrix as a, a Riemannian matrix is this one. And we also have corresponding uh, second fundamental form k. I'm not, I didn't write down here. So we want to construct this function s to satisfy uh, the property. First is positive because we want the matrix to be a complete Riemannian matrix. And this we want, uh, this is, um, I think, called super harmonic function, but only in the x1 to x n minus 1 variable. So this derivative does not involve z. And this condition holds we can verify the initial data set satisfy the dominant energy condition. And then we also need s goes to 1 at certain rate, so it's asymptotically flat. And the upshot is we can find quite explicit a large class of S only in dimension n greater than eight to satisfy all those properties. And then the corresponding initial data set will be a complete non-vacuum. So whether it's vacuum, determine whether this uh, Laplace prime S is zero or not. But our examples has strictly negative somewhere. So it's non-vacuum, it's asymptotically flat, and with zero ADM mass. So the zero ADM mass here means the E equals to no P. So if you heard about the space-time positive mass theorem, I think it's um, a um, surprising example because we expect zero ADM mass should be Minkowski. And there are some results along this direction. And I myself did some work to prove that, right? I hope it's not a counter example to my own result. So uh, a careful looking at those examples, you see those examples, they have suboptimal for off rate. So here um, we know Q is so the optimal for off rate is N minus two, the, the rate of harmonic function. But this has a um, slower decay rate. But still, it's in the range where the ADMS are well defined. And the reason is for the rigidity part, and which proved by these people, and actually not in the original Shen Yang and Witten's proofs, they only show if E is zero, the initial data set in Minkowski. But E equals P is a, um, a, a stronger or a weaker assumption. E equals P only. And in our results, we actually require a Q greater than N minus three. So there's a really intriguing um, discrepancy on those conditions. And of course, for a long time, I thought that was only a technical assumption. Again, it's just by constructing certain functions and we need um, this condition. But it turns out um, the rigidity would fail just by those examples I show you, if Q is not big enough. And also those examples we can show to when you take a, enough, a large compact set, and you can show that it, its tier region is a uh, mass minimi minimizing its tension. So in other words, those examples also give you counter examples to those conjectures of phonic. Okay. All right, so um, then 
I will go to probably the, the meat of the proof. So we have a space time killing and dominant energy scalar and ADMS. There is like a lot of intriguing, totally look different quantities and but they have very intriguing connections. So a vector field is called killing if it satisfies the killing equation or in other words, the gradient of Y is a anti-symmetric tensor. And for a killing vector field of space time, we can look at the decomposition because now we have a preferred slice and we can look at decomposition, the orthogonal projection into the normal part and the lens we call F and the tangential part. And physicists like to call these laps and shifts pair. And a killing equation tells you why satisfy certain equation, right? But then that can be also be right as equation for f and x on the initial data set, but a much involved equation. So that's the result by Moncrief, a classical result, Moncrief, which I like very much, is if the space time, the first statement say a space time has a killing vector, and then you're looking at the lapse and shift. And it tells you this condition actually is equivalent to saying that the initial data set um, has the fx satisfies certain equation. And this equation I denote by d phi star. So it takes some time to digest this notation. So phi, remember, is the Einstein constraint map. And then d phi is we take a linearization of it. Okay, and then take a star is the formal adjoint operator. So this quantity phi comes out from the study of Fisher Marston. It actually originated from whether the scalar curvature um, is you can prescribe scalar curvature. They're basically looking at the inverse function theorem. If the linearization is injective, then or sorry, the linearization is subjective, uh, the nonlinear map is locally subjective, so you can prescribe scalar curvature map. So the similar question can be asked for the constraint map. So I will not write down the whole equation for the d phi star, but I just show you the first few terms. So it's an overdetermined elliptic system. As you expect, the killing vector is an overdetermined elliptic equation. Right? In general, you don't expect any solution at all for the killing equation. So the corresponding equation, this d phi star is also overdetermined. And in general, you don't expect any solution. Now you can ask either way, you can ask whether uh, space-time satisfy a killing, uh, sorry, a space-time has a killing vector, or you can ask equivalently whether you can find a non-trivial solution to this d phi star equation. That's a system of equations. So there is some um, examples of the vacuum space-time with killing is actually also one of the important questions, right? Whether we can find out all oh, vacuum space-time with a uh, killing vector field, right? We know there are some of them and on the some condition, they're actually expected to be the only solutions, right? But it depend on what boundary conditions you impose. So we have Minkowski, we have Schwarzschild, we have Kerr solution. But interestingly, from the positive mass theorem point of view, low space times are also the ADM mass minimizers. So Minkowski is you assume um, just the, like a initial data set is complete and then minimize the mass must be a slice in the Minkowski. For the Schwarzschild is coming from the minimizer of the Penrose, Riemannian Penrose inequality, right? And Kerr is the expected minimizer of the general space-time Penrose inequality. So there is definitely some conditions, some relations why those minimizers are, should have killing vector. So to describe this, we introduced the notation called improvable. So it's actually more general than what I said here, but we want to say a dominant energy scalar is improvable if you can find locally you can find compactly supported deformation to bump up the dominant energy scalar. 
So that's the same questions for similar question for scalar curvature. If you have a um, metric, you want to ask whether you can bump up the scalar curvature only in the compact set, right? So just like if you have a Euclidean plan, can you make a matrix identical Euclidean outside some compact region, but make it strictly positive? The scale curve is strictly positive, and we know it cannot be done by the positive mass theorem. Right? So then, by those arguments, the conformal change arguments started from Shen Yao and been used to study this mass minimizer questions. Is we can formulate this fact if you have an initial data set, which is a, a minimizer of the mass, adding mass, then the sigma is not improvable. So that means you cannot bump up this, this scalar quantity only in the compact region. And then to improve this, uh, so we want to ask the opposite. Can we improve the dominant energy scalar? So we call the dominant energy scalar is the mu minus j. And if we can prescribe mu and j, that means we can prescribe phi the constraint map. And it's not enough to, to bump up sigma because the j's norm is taken with respect to g's. You are able to prescribe mu and j, but then you lose control of g. So just to overcome that question, we introduce um, um, a new operator called modified constraint operator. Probably it will be impossible to digest <laughs> in this new definition just in this uh, one slide. But roughly speaking, it says we are able to uh, cancel out the term where you linearize the J. So this extra term is to cancel out that. So, so the uh, upshot is we prove if sigma is not improvable, then this modified operator has the linearized adjoint has a non-trivial kernel. But this is the almost the same operator up to lower the turn. So this is also over-determined elliptic. Okay, so I'm toward the end of my talk is, um, so the new thing we prove um, with, I prove with Dan Lee is, if sigma is not improvable, then we know by our result with Covino, there's a non-trivial kernel. Although we didn't know what that means, we don't have any good physical reasonings of this equation, unlike the result in Moncrief, right? For this unmodified operator, this fx correspond to killing, but we don't have luck here. Does it, does it correspond to anything geometric? Yes, that has been uh, bugged me for many, many years. And the, this equation alone, we don't know. Okay. But the new thing is we find out this equation, okay, it's true, but we actually say being non-improvable has a more stronger condition on the kernel element. It actually has to satisfy the second equation. And then I will get to your questions, okay. Spiro. Okay. And this second equation, we call that J no vector equation, because if Fx correspond to a space-time vector, then this vector, the lapse and shift, then this second equation tells you that vector is null. And you actually point in a very specific direction determined by J, whenever J is not zero. Of course, when J is zero, then this is a vacuous condition. So um, I have a proof, but schedule proof. But then back to Spiro's question is that system, that two equations does have a geometric meaning. So just one equation alone, we don't know. But these two, together, these two equations together, that's what we call the star equation. We have an analogous result of Moncrief's theorem. So Moncrief's theorem tells you if you have some kernel element of the D5 star, and then the space time is vacuum and is killing. And here, we're for a non-vacuum initial data set, if we have a fx satisfy that system of equations, then first we can show sigma is constant. 
And the second we can now, this actually sits in the also very specific state space time. That's a not perfect fluid space time. And we actually know what the pressure and what the velocity is. Okay. And that space time has a killing vector. So if you remember our statement for the bionic stationary conjecture, which is say, which is proved by the following way is okay, it's a mass minimizer. So it's not improvable. If it's not improvable, there's a non-trivial solution to the star. And then that imply it has to um, be constant, but we know it's zero at infinity. So it has to be zero. And then it also has to be inside this space time. But since P is zero, so it's a node dust. And this vector field, why we can see is um, no, only when J is not zero. So all the consequences will follow from this theory. Okay. Um, and I think that's all about this result. And I thank you for being here. <laughs>